Uh, we're going to talk about some pieces of evidence that you need to know and also some key vocabulary. So make sure that you're filling in your notes. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible. So anything that's underlined, that's what you need to be filling in on your Cornell notes as we go. So our big idea essential question for today is how do living things change over time? Yeah, so I guess we need to be asking ourselves not how one organism changes in the course of its lifetime, but if we look at all of the organisms that make up its family over many generations, that we should see some changes because the environment changes. Okay, so our first big question for today is what is evolution? This is an introduction to evolution, so we should probably go ahead and define it. So evolution is when living things change over time. Another big name that always comes up when we talk about evolution is Charles Darwin, and you've probably heard of him before. He's one of the most famous biologists of all time, and, and he's kind of seen as the father of evolutionary theory. It was really his observations that led to this theory of evolution that we have. So let's go ahead and start talking about what he found out. So Darwin proposed the idea that evolution happens through something called natural selection. So I need to pause and break this down. First, I want to remind myself, well, what does evolution mean? Evolution means living things changing, changing over time. So he proposed that this change happens through something called natural selection. So Ms. Cook, when you see that word natural, what do you think of? I just, I think about things in nature, like things that I can okay. see that aren't necessarily man-made. So I'm going to go ahead and write that down under natural. And, and when you see the word selection or selecting something, what does that mean? To hand pick, like if I select things at the grocery store, I'm nice. not going to collect everything. There are very specific things that I want to pick out. Okay, so if we put this together, I have this idea that natural selection has to do with nature picking or choosing. So at this point, you have a stop and jot question you need to answer, so go ahead and pause the video and answer that question. All right, so now we're going to go into a little bit more about natural selection. We know that natural selection is something with nature picking or choosing, but what does it really mean? Um, well, what this definition we have here says is natural selection is when organisms with good genes live and pass down their genes, but organisms with bad genes die out. So it's kind of like if I'm at the grocery store and I want to shop for apples. I'm going to right. pick the good apples, and I'm going to leave the bad apples alone. Right. Only the good apples are making it home. Okay. The result of natural selection is organisms with adaptations for their environment. So an adaptation is a trait that helps an organism survive or reproduce in its environment. So let's take a look at these organisms we have here and think about what adaptations they have. So let's start with this dog or puppy here. When I think about adaptations and I'm looking at other organisms besides humans, I ask myself, well, what can it do that I can't do? Yeah. Because that makes us different. So if I think about dogs, I know that dogs have a really good sense of smell. Oh, yeah. So that happens to be an adaptation because that's something that is unique uh, to this particular species that we don't have as humans. We can mm -hmm. smell things, but we just don't have an acute smell uh, like dogs do. Right. They also have really big ears um, and great hearing. A lot of times uh, my dogs can hear, you know, a car coming up to my driveway way before I can hear it. Right. So that's a unique adaptation or unique ability, physical ability, that this organism has that we don't have. Right. And we know that both of these things would help the dog to survive in its environment. And so they're adaptations. Yeah. And if it can survive, that means theoretically it can live long enough to do what in the future? To reproduce and to pass on its good genes for a good sense of smell and great hearing. And so what if this dog didn't have a great sense of smell and didn't have good hearing? Um, well, probably if this dog was in the wild, it wouldn't survive. Those would be some bad genes, and it probably wouldn't reproduce and pass those on to its kids. Okay. What about these weird-looking birds on the right? <laughs> so over here we have a, this is a male peacock, and this is a female peacock. Now, I got to say, that peacock's tail does not look helpful at all. Um, it's it's huge. It seems like it'd be really easier for a predator to just snag that thing and, and eat the peacock. I cannot figure out why this peacock would have this adaptation. Well, there has to be a reason. Otherwise, that gene wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be able to pass on the particular trait that allows it to make that huge tail mm -hmm. with all of those colors in, in the feathers. So one thing that we do know about peacocks is that the only way that they can mate, and this is true for birds in general, the male birds tend to have a lot more um, ornamentation when it comes mm -hmm. to their feathers, and they tend to be more uh, brightly colored. Yes. The reason why is is because female birds, guess what they like? They like bright colors. They like bright they colors. Like big feathers. And they love those big feathers. So <laughs> if this peacock didn't have this particular adaptation, what wouldn't it be able to do? It wouldn't be able to reproduce. 
there's a couple other really cool types of adaptations this is awesome. out of there. One of them is camouflage. So camouflage is the be ability of an organism to blend in with its environment. Um, now I'm looking at this picture and I don't know if I can spot the organism. Do you see it? Yeah, it looks like I have a head over there on the left-hand side. Oh. There it is. And then there's a tail on the right-hand side, and the body is in the middle connecting the two, although it's really hard to see. Yeah, it's so hard. Um, this guy here is called a satanic leaf gecko, um, and they have an amazing camouflage ability. You can see it would be really hard for a predator to find them um, if they were hiding in these leaves. Here's another cool type of adaptation. This is called mimicry. So I can break down this word a little bit. What does it mean if you mimic something? To mimic something just means to copy it. Okay. So if you mimic someone's behavior, you, you do the same thing that they're doing. Right. Um, so when I look at these two pictures here, when I look quickly, it looks like two different bees. And, you know, if I was outside, I'd want to watch out for both of them. Um, I wouldn't want to get stung. But actually, only one of these is a bee. Oh, can you guys guess which one is the bee and which one is the fly? Believe it or not, one of them is a fly. Miss Hines? I'm going to reveal the answer. This is the bee, and this is what's called a bee fly. So this guy over here actually cannot sting you. He's as harmless as a house fly, but this guy over here you would want to watch out for. So let's talk about a couple of different examples of natural selection so we can see how this works over time. Um, so in any population there are differences between species and we actually have a, a specific word we use to describe those differences. We call those differences variation. That's an important term. You're going to see that again. So you might want to find some space to write that on your paper. Variation. Yeah. And a very Variation just means differences. So for instance, if you look in a box of crayons, there'll be variation in color, right? So right. we'll have blues, greens, oranges, and so on. Um, so if you look at this picture here, you can spot some slight variations between these different fishes. Now here's how natural selection works. Remember, natural selection is when nature picks or chooses. So nature, the environment, is going to pick or choose the organisms that have more helpful traits, more helpful variations. And over time, only the organisms with the good genes are going to be the ones surviving and reproducing. The other ones are going to get eaten or are going to die off. Um, and so over time, we can see that the population of fish will change. So when I compare these ancestral fish, the older fish, fish to the younger fish, um, I noticed that they've changed quite a bit in their size and their shape and that they look much leaner and faster swimmers. So here's another example. Um, this is a picture of finches, which um, are birds that Darwin made a lot of observations of. Remember, we think evolution, we think change, and we think Darwin. Right. Um, and again, if I look at this picture, I see that there are variations. There are differences in the finches. Some of the finches are larger, some are smaller, some have bigger beaks, and some have smaller beaks. Now, over time, the ones with the more helpful traits are going to survive and reproduce better. So, for example, um, in this particular location, there are very hard nuts that these finches need to crack for their food. And only the finches with the larger beaks are going to be able to crack those nuts and get the food that's inside of them. Um, so nature is going to choose or pick the finches with the largest beaks, while the ones with the smaller beaks, uh, they're not going to get picked. They're probably not going to survive. So over time, I see that the finches have gone from having a variety of beak shapes to having much larger beak shapes through nature choosing or picking picking the ones with the biggest beaks. So we also have another phrase that we use for this process, and this is one you might have heard about. Natural yeah. selection is also called a survival of the fittest. Yeah. We tend to hear this a lot, particularly in sports. Yeah. Like the teams that have the um, best skill mm -hmm. or the best players are the teams that will survive, for instance, like in March Madness. Right. It's survival of the fittest. Once you lose, you get knocked out and you can't mm -hmm. go any further. So we can apply the same concept to living things. Right, except instead of the most fit being the ones that are the best basketball players, in natural selection, organisms that are the most fit are the ones that have those adaptations that help them survive or reproduce better in their environment. So at this point, you need to pause the video and answer your stop and jot question. So when we talk about evolution, a lot of times we hear about the theory of evolution. And theory is really a word that's kind of been hijacked 
by society? What, what, every day when people say, you know, I have a theory, what does that mean? It really means that they don't really have any proof. It, right. It's more of an assumption. But in science, we use it very differently. Mm -hmm. In science, a theory is an idea that is supported by lots and lots of evidence and experiments. So what are the pieces of evidence that help to support our theory of evolution? Then? Well, there are three main types of evidence for the theory of evolution. Fossils. Fossils. So fossils are the remains of long dead organisms. So another really great thing about fossils is that we can use them to kind of put things in order. Um, and we do this using something called the principle of superposition. So do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. The principle of superpos uh, superposition basically states that the farther things down things are down in a particular layer, the like older they must here. be. Yeah, so now it's, here's our old Yeah, stuff. so it doesn't tell us the exact age. So if we look at that, we don't know that this is 10,000 years old versus mm -hmm. being 13,000 years old. But we know that that bottom layer has to contain organisms that are older than mm -hmm. all of the layers that are on top of it. The other cool thing about fossils is that we can actually see with our own eyes how things have changed over time. Um, so for example, scientists have found fossils of ancient camels, and they can see from looking at these fossils that camels used to look very different than they do today. So another line of evidence for the theory of evolution is our anatomy. And anatomy is just basically the way our bodies are put together. Yeah, so we can basically look at the parts of organisms to determine whether or not there's been a change over time and also if they're related. Cool. So one really poor, important type of anatomy we look at is something called homologous structures. Now when I look at that word, it sounds kind of familiar to another word we talked about this year. I kind of am thinking back to genetics. I remember learning about a word called homozygous. Yeah, and we asked you guys to focus on the prefix of that word or the, the yeah. front part of that word. And we know that the prefix homo means? Same. All right, so if we have homologous structures, we don't even have to worry about the back end of that word. We yeah. just know that that word means the structures are? The same. All right, so let's look at the examples that we provided. Okay. Um, so in this example, I have a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat limb, so kind of like their arm. And when I look at this picture, what I see is that these structures are actually really similar. They're the same, right. almost. And that's, that's pretty surprising. I didn't know that a human arm and a bat arm or wing looked this similar. Well, it's hard to think about it that way because we know that we use our arm differently than a bat uses its wing. Right, and we use our arm differently than a whale uses its flipper. But that's probably because we live in very different environments. Right. But we can still use that bone structure to tell us what? Um, it tells us that we must all be related, that we came from what's called a common ancestor. So if there are common ancestors and there are homologous structures, mm -hmm. there has to be a term for the opposite. Right, for things that are not from common ancestors. Yeah, that are dissimilar. Mm -hmm. And that, that term is something called an analogous structure. And again, I've, I've seen words really similar to this in biology class this year. I know that several times this year we've made analogies mm -hmm. in class. For example, we made our cells like a city books. Yeah. Where we made an analogy between cells and cities or cells and schools. So analogies, remember, are when you kind of put together two things that aren't that similar and you, and you make them seem similar to one another. So like a cell and a city. Well, in analogous structures, you have two structures in an organism that um, are actually pretty different, but they, they look very similar from the outside. So what would make them seem similar? Um, so some of the things that, that make them seem similar are they're used for kind of similar purposes. So for example, if I look at my example here, this dragonfly wing and this bird's wing, if I looked inside of them, they're, they're very different from one another, but they use them for the same thing. They both use them to fly. So they, they come from or they live in the same environment, right, in the but air. they don't have a common ancestor. Right. They so go ahead and pause the video and see if you can remember the difference between homologous and analogous structures. Biochemistry. And we had a whole unit on biochemistry and biology. It was a while ago, though. It huh? was a while ago. So should we talk about that word really quickly? Maybe we should. So we know the prefix bio at this point means... Life. Life. So this is the chemistry of life. And we know chemistry deals with really small things like atoms and molecules. Um, and so biochemistry are the atoms and molecules that are really important for life. And there's one molecule in particular that we, we spend a lot of time talking about, particularly yeah. when we're trying to compare things. Right. And that molecule is? DNA. DNA. All living things have it. 
And so we can look at organisms' DNA in order to figure out their evolutionary history. Organisms that have similar DNA are more closely related. This makes sense, right? Like you and your siblings have very similar DNA because you're closely related to them. And Ms. Hines, what do you mean when you say similar DNA? Oh, so remember, when I'm comparing DNA, there's one part of the DNA in particular that I compare. It's those nitrogen bases on the inside, those four letters inside the DNA. A, T, C, and G. So if two organisms have similar DNA, it means the order of their letters, their nitrogen bases, is very similar. So go ahead and pause the video and answer your question. So there are actually a couple of different types of evolution. There are two main types. The first is something called divergent evolution. You want to tell us what that means? Sure. So a lot of you guys are either have been behind the wheel or you're starting to learn how to drive. So this term divergent has probably come up before mm -hmm. in, in driver's ed or something like that. Right. So if you are diverging in a car, that means that you are actually moving away from another car. So here I am driving in the car, and then I'm going to go this way, and the other car is going to go this, this way. way. That's diverging. But are we coming from the same point? Did we start in the same location? Yeah, we started off together over here. But we're going to end up in? Two different locations. So we can apply this concept to living things as well. Okay. So let's look at the pictures that we have. We've seen this picture on the left before. What are those pictures representative of? Um, so they're representative of the limbs of different animals. And remember, those are what kind of structure? They should be called homologous structures because right. we know that they are the same. Right. Um, even though they're not necessarily used for the same function. So homologous structures, if they are similar, that means that they had to start off in the same location or the same point or with the same ancestor. Right, with our common ancestor. But over time, they've moved into different environments. For instance, the bat lives in a very different place than we do, and a whale obviously lives in a very different place than both of those. So they're right. going to be using them differently, so the use has diverged. Right. Um, and if we look at this picture over here of our finches, um, again, they all started off together with this common ancestor, but then we see all these arrows coming out from this one place. They're diverging. Um, and to, today, these finches look quite different. So some of them have real small beaks for eating leaves or insects, while some of them have these really large beaks for eating fruit. Now, the other type is something called convergent evolution. Um, so what does it mean if you converge? So to converge is the opposite of diverge. So okay. instead of starting at one central place and then separating, we're actually going to start off in two separate locations, okay. and we're going to meet in one common place. Ah. So in this case, we're not going to be talking about homologous structures. We're going to be talking about analogous structures. Those ones that are two different things getting put together to look similar. Okay, so we have the same two examples that we used previously when we talked about analogous structures. We have a dragonfly on the left and we have a bird on the right hand mm -hmm. side. Now these two things obviously do not have a common ancestor, right no. Ms. Um, Because if we look at their bone structure, their bone structure is not similar. Very different. But if we look at the use in which we're, how they use their mm -hmm. wings, we know that they use their wings in a similar fashion. So they they were forced to evolve structures that have the same function because they live in a similar place. Okay, so at this point, you should have filled in all your notes. What you need to do now is go back and try and fill in the left side of your notes with your Cornell questions. Make sure that you pause and show your teacher when you finish before going on to the next activity. 